But today we have uh, Professor Dene Reed, who uh, is in the Department of uh, Anthropology here at UT. Um, he did his PhD at Stony Brook University, and as, as he just mentioned to us, did a postdoc at the Smithsonian, which is uh, must be the coolest place ever to do a to do a postdoc. Um, he does a lot of research in things that I myself uh, have, I'm not familiar with. For example, taphonomy. Uh, maybe he can explain to us what that is. Terrestrial paleoecology, human evolution, um, and uh, um, you know, it interfaces a lot with, with with machine learning research. So I'm, I'm very excited to learn about uh, these areas and to hear what he's up to and to uh, find out his perspective on on AI and machine learning. So please, uh, you know, thank you for being here and and, and take it away. Oh, and also one last thing, sorry to interrupt you. If you have a question, please put your question in the chat and um, either Alex or I or, or Verena will, will gently inter uh, interrupt the speaker. Um, please put all questions in the chat. Um, don't just unmute yourself and, and, and we'll get to them as, as best we can. So please, Danae, take it away. Great, hey, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to join and participate in the seminar series. I was really excited to uh, discover the machine learning lab, and uh, and uh, as I was mentioning at the start of this, uh, I've always been really excited by the opportunity to uh, meet people kind of outside my department, outside my college, doing different interesting things here at UT. And so uh, I want to take the opportunity today to share a little bit about the work that I'm doing, and particularly to invite um, ideas and opportunities for kind of collaboration or thoughts about how to apply machine learning um, to my domain, paleoanthropology, which for which machine learning is, is really new. And we're kind of discovering how to apply it and what some of the potential might be. So I'm gonna focus on that a little bit and share my screen to start my presentation here. Actually, hold on, let me share my whole screen. That work better. All right, can everybody see that? Cool. Looks good. Is this, uh, are you in presentation mode now? I thought so, yeah, it looks small to me. It looks, it looks small, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's not too bad, but it's not uh, try again. Uh, yeah, my chinch. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of curious. Let me try it again, going straight to the application, see if that makes a difference. Yeah, that is bad. That's that's better. Yeah. Yeah, it was better. Now it's small. Now again. it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. I've not had that problem before. Yeah, it's ah. strange. Uh, I mean, this this is this is this is fine. You could do it here, or you, if you go in presentation, it's it changes the resolution oddly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'll roll with this, and uh, let me see if I can expand the uh, the slide area a little bit. Yeah, this this is this is pretty good yeah all right we'll roll with that great well thanks again everyone so um i'm really kind of excited for the opportunity to talk a little bit uh, about my research on early human evolution and advances in our field related to especially the data integration and application for remote sensing and the ability to identify new potential fossil localities uh, in africa and places where we work and find fossils and I'm especially interested, as I mentioned before, in kind of kickstarting a discussion with the AI and machine learning community on how these technologies might be used to address some of the specific challenges in paleoanthropology. So this is kind of a, an interesting time period for paleoanthropology. Um, we're quickly approaching the centenary of Raymond Dart's 1925 publication on Australopithecus africanus, which was one of the first fossil species identified in Africa and really marks the beginning of modern paleoanthropological research in Africa. 
Um, in the intervening years, paleoanthropologists have discovered numerous new species, technologies, behaviors, and identified key adaptations that define and, and shape our ancestry. Uh, furthermore, we've had tremendous strides in refining the chronology and the biogeography and environmental context associated with these events. So in other words, our discovery-driven efforts over the past decades have been very successful in, in sketching out the fundamental kind of who, what, where, and when of human biological and cultural evolution. Yet, as I'll illustrate, many of the fundamental causal explanations, like, like those why questions, really remain elusive and difficult to answer. So the rapid productive growth in paleoanthropology has been accomplished in part through gritty kind of determination under harsh field conditions and by expanding our scientific toolkit to embrace new technologies and connections to related fields. So modern paleoanthropology is wide ranging and draws from a host of related disciplines, including kind of the earth sciences, behavioral sciences, genetics, proteomics, ecology, and of course, computer science and imaging. So this slide kind of gives a roadmap for where I'd like to go today. And I'm gonna start with a little background into our current paleoanthropological research at uh, the site where I work at now, which is called Mile Logia, and it's in Northeastern Ethiopia. And that work focuses on understanding the adaptive shifts related to the origin of our own genus, Homo, which occurs at a very dynamic period in human evolution, roughly between three and two and a half million years ago. And then stepping out beyond Meliologia, I'd like to look at the possibilities for integrating the data we have from that site with other projects in the East African Rift System and the importance of conducting integrative research and analysis. And so in doing this, I'll also highlight my work on PaleoCore, which is a web-based platform for data integration in paleoanthropology. And then from that, um, I'll present some ideas on how I think AI and machine learning can be applied to address some of the challenges in paleoanthropology and specifically looking at applications in remote sensing and image classification to identify new fossil sites, as well as maybe the analysis of 3D imagery to assist in the identification and taxonomic classification of fossil specimens. So most broadly, my research is motivated by a kind of fundamental question, which is how has the environment shaped hominid adaptation and human evolution? And for me, uh, this question is evocative because it focuses on what is likely the primary cause for major human adaptations, especially early on, which is environmental conditions. It's, it's fundamentally a why question. Now to address these kind of questions in paleobiology, we rely on a suite of data sources and analytical techniques. So interpretations about the past are based on a consilience across diverse and independent proxies. So no single data source or proxy really provides a perfect picture, but when used in combination, we're able to triangulate on reliable assertions about past events. Significantly, this means that paleoanthropology relies on very heterogeneous, and diverse streams of information drawn from a wide range of related disciplines. One challenge associated with paleoenvironmental analysis and paleoanthropology is linking also across a range of spatial scales. So global phenomena such as variation in Earth's orbit that affect global temperatures through deep time to regional geological and tectonic processes such as faulting and volcanism that affect topography and regional precipitation and vegetation patterns, eventually down to local basins and sites where uh, our ancestors interact with the, the, the totality of these influences. So um, I point this out now because it becomes important later when we focus on the challenge of integrating phenomena that have different impacts depending on the spatial scale. I'll also emphasize that this is um, kind of why we really started invoking spatial analysis in GIS and remote sensing, and why they play such an important role in paleoanthropological research. So explicit spatial modeling kind of helps control for the variation that occurs at different spatial scales. And all this is to say that analysis of paleobiological events really relies on diverse inputs across a wide range of spatial and temporal scales.
So as I mentioned earlier, paleoanthropology has been successful in documenting the basic outlines of our lineage. Now I'm gonna take just a minute here to review kind of the current consensus model of human evolutionary research. We can think about human evolution as unfolding in sort of four major stages. Uh, the first, the earliest stage, um, includes a spotty sampling of taxa close to the split from the human chimp last common ancestor around 7 million years ago. And the earliest fossils are fragmentary and the samples are small and there's ongoing debate about the taxonomic affinities of it, even whether the these fossils properly belong on our lineage or some other great ape lineage. And this is what you'd expect for fossils at the, the base of our lineage because there's been little time to accrue the diagnostic traits that come to distinguish humans from other great apes. But what these early taxa also exhibit, or they all exhibit, are small canines or small canine teeth and some morphological indication of upright posture and bipedal locomotor adaptation. So walking on two legs is one of the major first adaptations that defines our lineage. Um, and within this group, there are there's at least one really well-preserved skeleton of Artificus rabidus from about 4.4 million years ago in the middle olive wash region of Ethiopia. And Argus has a pelvis showing morphological adaptations for walking on two legs, but still retains a divergent big toe for grasping and climbing using their feet. The second stage includes a now diverse cluster of general, what we call Australopithecine taxa anchored by two well-established and well-documented species, Australopithecus afarensis, which is the species to which Lucy belongs, and that's in East Africa, and Australopithecus africanus, which is known from South Africa. Now, this group has become increasingly diverse in recent years, including um, and kind of leading to interpretations of a much more bushy view of human evolution than we had before, and reinvigorating debates about species delimitation in the fossil record a topic that's also relevant to the emergence of our genus Homo, as we'll get to later. The third cluster represents an evolutionary trajectory emphasizing adaptations for heavy chewing and mastication, featuring enlarged molar teeth, massive jaws, and associated changes in cranial architecture to support the chewing muscles and forces generated by them. So this group is often arranged in two genera, in its own genus, sorry, Paranthropus with representatives uh, in both East and South Africa. And then finally, the fourth group represents our own genus Homo and includes the many intermediary species that link us to the Australopithes, from Homo habilis to Homo erectus and Neanderthals and modern humans. So within this group are two species uh, that are especially relevant to our discussion today, Homo habilis and uh, Homo rudolfensis, and also possibly a third as yet undescribed earlier species that's ancestral to these two. So within this framework of human evolution, there are key milestones and periods that are of particular interest to us as paleoanthropologists. For example, the earliest period following the split from the chimp human last common ancestor is significant for understanding the adaptations that initially define our lineage. So exactly which African great ape species represents our last common ancestor remains one of the key mysteries in paleoanthropology here. And similarly, in the period between 300 and 100,000 years ago, um, this period is significant uh, for understanding the morphological and behavioral hallmarks that distinguish our species, modern Homo sapiens, which is unique in many behavioral characteristics, including abstract and symbolic representation, trade and exchange systems, niche expansion to include marine resources, and a lot of other unique behaviors and adaptations that set modern humans apart from, say, their contemporaries, Neanderthals. What both these questions have in common is a focus um, on the features that make humans distinct. With the earliest hominids, how are we distinct from other great apes? And with modern humans, how are we distinct from our fossil cousins, Neanderthals and Homo erectus. In both, the fundamental question is existential. It's a question of what makes us human. So between these two key events is another interval, the period between three and two and a half million year ago, years ago. And this is perhaps the most dynamic and significant period in human evolution. 
It's an interval when Australopithecus afarensis, that is Lucy species, goes extinct in East Africa. And we find the first fossils attributed to Paranthropus and also the earliest fossils attributed to our own genus Homo. So this time period also marks the origin of archeological sites and intense tool manufacture. And this time period is coincident with prominent shifts in global climate patterns, which transitioned from more stable climatic regimes earlier to this, during the Myopliocene, to more dynamic and extreme fluctuations associated with the later Pleistocene ice ages. So this interval has been of interest to paleoanthropologists for a long time. And uh, it goes back to even as far as the mid 80s, when people began highlighting um, this interval as an important period where a lot of there, there's a lot of mammalian faunal turnover and other events that we see um, in terms of faunal composition and turnover in the fossil record. Uh, so can I ask um, a, a, a stupid question uh, that I was curious about? So I understand that everything here is based on on fossilized uh, uh, bones that we find. Do we, we do we? I understand we of course you know, group them together to say, oh, these belong in the same uh, uh, organism or different ones, or do we use also DNA or do we have other methodological ways of looking other than, than, uh, than the shapes and the morphology of the bones that we find? No, it's an excellent question. So it really depends on the age of the fossils that we're considering. So in the debate, for instance, about the origin of modern humans, uh, that goes back to about 100,000 years ago, and that really pushes, that's about the, the early limit for the use of ancient DNA. So they've been successful in recovering ancient DNA from Neanderthal fossils going back to about 30, 35,000 years ago. And that's provided a lot of really useful information about the comparative genetics and genomics for Neanderthals, modern humans, and it also illustrated or revealed the existence of a third before unknown group called the Denisovans. As we go further back in time, basically anything kind of older than a hundred or a few hundred thousand years ago, we don't have any more biological material preserved in terms of DNA. So everything's based on skeletal morphology. Okay. Is it, is it possible that, you know, we just haven't found the right excavation site and that there could be preserved DNA that's way older or is there some fundamental reason why it stops there? fundamental reason is just that the molecule is unstable and the conditions okay. for preservation there's you know maybe there's some extreme examples of under really cold conditions or others where it might be right i was thinking if it's frozen somewhere and you know uh, uh, hard to say hard to possibly you know the, the idea of for instance dna preserved in amber that was the basis for like jurassic park isn't completely far-fetched but <laughs> nobody's been able to pull it off yet and for Paranthropus, do we have DNA for that, or is that too old? Too old. Okay. Yeah, so everything um, from sort of Homo erectus earlier, even basic for Neanderthals and older, we don't have DNA for yet. Um, yeah, so it's all based on morphology. Um, So some of the challenges um, to, in addressing kind of the question associated with this time period between three and two and a half million years ago have been, one, we lack fossils in this particular time interval, especially uh, in East Africa. And I'll also argue that the challenge of integrating data from different sites uh, and integrating the fossil record with data from geology, climatology, and related disciplines is really important. And so our work at Melilogia specifically targets fossils in this three to two and a half million year time interval. And to put that in context, I'm gonna start by quickly reviewing the, the history of some of the fossil discoveries related to the genus Homo, and then talk a little bit more about our work in Melilogia. So the fossil record for early Homo uh, dates back to discoveries in the early 1960s at Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. The initial description of Homo habilis is based on the type specimen shown here, which is OH7, Olduvai hominid 7. And this is a juvenile skeleton that includes a mandible, like the lower jaw, part of the parietal bones and the side of the skull, and some associated hand bones. And from the cranial reconstruction based on the parietal bones, we can estimate the internal volume of, this, of the skull was approximately 674 cubic centimeters which is a 
decent increase over the average cranial capacity we see in other great apes like chimpanzees and uh, an increase over what we see in Australopithecus afarensis, all of which have cranial capacities around 400 cubic centimeters. So an overall trend in human evolution is for increasing cranial capacities and brain expansion. And so one of the hallmarks associated with early homo is some of this initial cranial capacity. Um, also the finger bones indicate kind of a precision grip, which the discoverer, Louis Leakey, interpreted to be an important uh, adaptation for tool use early on. So the OH7 fossil and subsequent finds uh, linked homo habilis, uh, that are linked to homo habilis are dated to between 1.8 and 2 million years ago. But it was suspected that the genus originated earlier than this. But the origins, the early origins of homo remain kind of enigmatic, mostly because we don't have a lot of fossils from this time period between two and a half and three million years ago. But that began to change in the mid 1990s, um, first with the discovery of this fossil from the Afar and from um, Hadar, which is the same area where Lucy was discovered. And, uh, and that's the one shown on the left, Afar locality 666-1 is uh, dates to about 2.33 million years ago. And it's considered when it was found uh, to be one of the earliest representatives of our genus. And it's compared here to the upper jaw, the maxilla of uh, Australopithecus afarensis, the same species as Lucy that's shown on the right. And some of the key differences that you'll see are uh, differences in the size of the canine and in the space between the canine and the other teeth, that's called a diastema. Um, the overall molar size is pretty similar, but there's some shifts in the occlusal outline, shape and dimensions of the molars that are partly diagnostic. And there are also changes in the width and depth of the palate and other aspects of the morphology. And all of this people use to um, attribute this fossil, AL666, to is one of the earliest clear representatives of our genus Homo. You also notice that the palate is shorter, which is indicative of a face that's more vertical and less projecting, which is what you see in things like Lucy and other great apes, actually. Then more recently, um, in uh, 2015, I believe, um, this, at the site of Ledi Gururu, uh, which is just 60 kilometers northeast from Hadar, researchers discovered the mandible uh, LD350, shown here, uh, that they attributed to Homo based on the dental and mandibular anatomy. And this specimen was recovered from deposits dating to roughly 2.8 million years ago. So now we're really pushing back the origin of uh, our genus Homo. Excuse and me. suggesting, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. There's a question on the chat uh, uh, by Tyler uh, Collins. The question is, uh, to what extent do the possibilities of medical pathologies factor into this morphological analysis, which I guess means if the particular person had this specific problem, I'm, I'm just translating question to my simple uh, words. It just means if some the particular individual had the problem, how do you know if that's a particular individual, I guess, versus the other whole species, right? Yeah. So, um... There are fossils that do indicate or show signs of medical pathologies that you can, where the, the change in the either the, for instance, the shape or texture of the bone might indicate a pathology. Sometimes the changes in size are indicative of pathologies. Um, generally, if you have a specimen that seems otherwise healthy, you assume that the morphology you're seeing is indicative of a healthy individual. Um, but one of the ongoing questions and challenges is always trying to establish how much variation there is within any of these taxa, given the limited sample sizes that we have. And that varies from one taxa to another. So for things like Australopithecus afarensis, we have a pretty uh, large sample of over 400 individuals of that species. So you can begin to get pretty reliable estimates on um, individual variation within that taxa. For others, like early homo, we only have a few specimens. And then trying to decide which of these differences are attributable to say sex differences between men and women or males and females, and which are attributable to differences between species becomes a really challenging problem. And that's an ongoing persistent problem and challenge in our field. And it's a challenge of species delimitation. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much. 
Um, so at, uh, at about 2.8 million, uh, we see kind of the earliest representative of our genus. And um, this was one of the main reasons, the discovery of this fossil that, uh, and kind of the lack of fossils in general in this time period between two and a half and three million years ago, this was really the impetus for um, our research at Millilogia, which was to discover additional fossil evidence related to this really important period in, in human evolution, for which we have not many fossils. Um, so the Millilogia project is located in the Afar Triangle of Northeastern Ethiopia, uh, adjacent to the sites of Boranzo Mille and Ledi Gararu. So we are just adjacent to Ledi Gararu, which is a site where this fossil was, a was found. Um, and, uh, and roughly 60 kilometers northeast of those other sites, Hadar and Dikika which are two other really important fossil sites that are older um, in age than what we have at Mille Logia. Um, the core of the study area extends over roughly 200 square kilometers at Mille Logia, and the sediments there span from a time range from about three to 2.4 million years ago. So it really covers the key period of this dynamic evolutionary change that uh, I've been talking about. Now, Melilogia and the surrounding projects are significant, one, because they cover this key time period between two and a half and three million years ago, and two, because they extend the depositional setting of the Paleo Lake at Hadar and Tikika, which are further south, which migrated northeast along the path of the modern Awash River. And the depositional sequences at Hadar and Tikika to the south are interrupted at 2.9 million years ago. So they have older sediments dating back to about 4 million, but then sedimentation there stops at about 2.9. And this is what creates that gap in our knowledge in the fossil record. And the overlying deposits in those areas make up a different formation, which has a very different depositional environment. But by combining the sequences at Hatter and Tikika, the older sequences there, with those at Mili Logia, and Ledi Gararu and Waranzo Mili further north, um, we can create a composite continuous record that spans roughly between four and two and a half million years ago. So we're getting a really nice long continuous sequence of deposits where we can find fossils. And this really starts to point to also the advantages of being able to combine data from each of these individual projects. And so that data integration component becomes really important. So to date, uh, Mili Logia has, uh, that project uh, has conducted five field seasons between 2014 and 2020 and collected over 2,700 fossils uh, from the core study area. Um, Mili Logia preserves a stratigraphic sequence that's roughly 60 meters thick and which we've divided into three main analytical units uh, shown in the summary stratigraphic column uh, here on the left. And then the geochronology or the dating at Mille Logia was established through a combination of argon-argon dating and magnetostratigraphy. So basalt at the base of the section dates to about 3.1 million years ago. And overlying these, we've got a series of sedimentary sequences spanning between 3.1 and 2.9 million. And then above that, up to 2.9 to 2.4 uh, for the uh, deposits at the upper end of the sequence. So overall between 3.1 and 2.4 at Mille Logia. Uh, MLP or Mille Logia also highlights the power of deploying uh, a fully digital data collection methodology uh, that permits us to individually capture the location of individual fossils using handheld mobile devices in the field. Uh, one major advantage of this is the ability to pinpoint the locations of fossils and more precisely determine the sedimentary context in which they occur. Now, overall, I said we collected about 2,700 fossils. From that, there's a small set of hominid remains that we've recovered from Mille Logia, uh, which we interpret as belonging to the genus Homo. Uh, based on morphometric measurements and specific anatomical characteristics. Um, the remains include uh, two proximal 
ulnae or elbow bones, um, a couple fragments from skull, and a complete upper molar. And again, the dimensions and the uh, occlusal outlines and other fine anatomy indicate that the molar is also an example of early homo. And here you can see that same molar and it's an upright second molar. And, and this is an upright first molar, but you get an idea of how it compares in terms of size. These are to scale roughly with other fossils of homo and Australopithecus. All right, so what I presented about Melelogia is kind of an example of a classic project-based approach to a specific question. And each project that's active, um, each paleoanthropological project that's active in Africa uh, in, in this region has its own kind of geographic and temporal focus. They also have their own sort of tacit traditions for data collection and um, data management um, and analysis. Uh, and broader interpretations within some kind of theoretical framework that each team sort of brings as they do their own research. But a lot of this is not shared or systematically organized and integrated across projects. So under this model, integration occurs at sort of a course level kind of because projects aren't sharing primary uh, data and published results tend to be limited to summary tables and narrative results. So the, this project-based approach has some benefits that arise naturally from how field areas are permitted, how funding is generated, and how research productivity is measured. And it emphasizes geographic and temporal identity and promotes strong kind of interdisciplinary exchange between specialists within a project, all working within a single area and time interval. But imagine if we could, what would happen um, if uh, we could combine data from, say, Dakika and Mililogia, uh, Hadar, Leti Gararu, all these sites down to West Turkana, Kubifora, and other sites along the East African Rift. This would provide a much more comprehensive regional picture of human evolution during the Pleistocene and vertebrate evolution spanning three to four million years across a geographical distance of about 1,700 kilometers. And this possibility reflects the potential of comprehensive data integration across sites. And I believe this also represents a powerful kind of future vision for paleoanthropology in the coming years. So, and this is a reason that I started PaleoCore, um, to provide a platform that can support systematic data collection by individual research projects, and when they're ready, uh, provide the tools to integrate analyses across these projects. So PaleoCore comprises three main components. And the first is a set of tools to process and processes for digital data collection. Um, this is a system we use at MLP that's uh, also been used at uh, sites around ours, such as Leda Gararu. And the second is a standardized set of terms or metadata descriptors to define the data that are collected. And these terms provide unambiguous metadata descriptions for information collected by various projects. And these standard definitions ensure compatibility in the meaning and application of the data across projects and provides kind of a lingua franca for exchanging and integrating data between them. And then the third major feature of PaleoCore is an online platform that allows teams to collaboratively store, edit, manage, and analyze their data wherever they are. And this online platform is built on a stack of open source technologies, including PostgreSQL spatial database, a Django web application server, and a set of APIs that allow access to the data from a variety of different client applications, including direct access from GIS and statistical applications. Well, PaleoCore is geared towards removing kind of the technical hurdles to scientific data integration. Um, but alongside this, and equally important, um, is the organization of the community and the social aspects of scientific data integration. So the African Rift Valley Research Consortium is a community of researchers associated with individual projects in the Rift Valley uh, that, that have come together to share data and work collaboratively across their different projects. So PaleoCore provides much of the technical infrastructure for our and Arvark provides opportunities for participants to meet, dialogue, and integrate their efforts at the conceptual and theoretical level. Arvark meetings foster fossilization, that is opportunities to organize, focus and organize their research, 
standardize and structure their field data, integrate the primary fossil artifact and geological data on human origins, and then link these data um, with related research in ecology, evolutionary biology, bioengineering, and the many other kind of related cognate fields that paleoanthropology connects to. And this last element, linking, is especially important when it comes to connecting paleoanthropology with a wider range of discipline. So that gets me to AI applications. And one of the big advantages of shifting towards a collaborative and integrative framework in paleoanthropology is the opportunity to kind of synthesize larger data sets that we couldn't put together before and detailing the locations of fossil discoveries. In fact, I'm presenting, I'm working, I'm currently working on compiling a comprehensive catalog of the entire hominid fossil record, which surprisingly doesn't yet exist. So this catalog opens a possibility to access much more training data to inform machine learning applications. And I see that at least two important potential directions that we could go with this, but I'm really open and excited to hear about other ideas if they're out there. But one is using the distribution of known fossil occurrences to identify new fossil deposits based on satellite and other remote sensing data. And second, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to aid in the interpretation of imagery and 3D models developed from CT scans or photogrammetry. So both are examples of essentially classification operations. So let's look a little bit more at the first. Well, satellite imagery and remote sensing data, uh, including aerial photographs and other things, have been used since the 1970s in paleoanthropology to help pinpoint known fossil sites and aid in the discovery of new ones. Um, satellites obviously have the advantage of being able to sense reflected uh, electromagnetic radiation beyond the visible spectrum into the near infrared and shortwave infrared, which is really useful in analyzing and mapping geological features especially. But until recently, remote sensing data saw limited use in paleoanthropology, and what was done was based mostly on human interpretation of imagery. So one of the first applications of um, artificial intelligence in paleoanthropology and remote sensing was the use of automated neural networks to analyze Landsat 7 ETM data. in order to form kind of a predictive model of fossil localities. And this was done in the Great Divide Basin of central Wyoming, which is an Eocene age, like 50 million year old paleoprimatology locality or research region. Um, so this analysis demonstrated the utility of neural networks for remote sensing classification uh, in a paleoanthropological context. And the, it produced a model with overall relatively good predictive accuracy, about 78%, except one of the challenges that came up was that the AI models tended to overpredict fossiliferous areas. So it tended to identify a lot of areas that were potentially fossiliferous that didn't in fact have fossils. Um, this made the actual application and use of this model a little difficult because going to personally um, uh, verify whether fossils are present is really obviously time consuming and resource consuming. Yeah, so, how did you do, how did you how do you decide, you know, this was a, a poor prediction? I mean, do you need large volume of fossil material, you know, material before you say, oh, this was this was useful or, you know, how how much how much work do you have to do? I mean, maybe It's a good chunk of work. So, um, based on, in this case, I think they used uh, 26 known fossil localities. Uh, to try and predict, and uh, obviously the sensor data from the satellite image, in this case, it's a Landsat 7 um, ETM image, which is a multi-spectral image with seven band. And they used the, essentially the land cover and reflectance properties in the satellite imagery to, to try to match areas where fossils were known to other, to predict where other areas are. And, and then they would visit a lot of those and see if fossils were in fact present. And overall, um, many of the ones that were predicted to have fossils did, leading to roughly over 75% overall accuracy. I think the total was 78. But it tended to also find a lot of areas that had similar reflectance, but no fossils. I think what this highlights is that um, 
land cover and the reflectance properties that the satellite is picking up are sufficient but not perfect indicators. So the idea would be able to bring in ancillary information, including topography, LIDAR, um, to bolster or, or expand the uh, types of information, the diversity of information that's informing the, the machine learning. But you did find some brand new sites that you didn't know of before. Yes, using they did. Technology. I see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was successful in that sense. Um, and it kind of proved the concept. So this was back in, in 2011. And, and one of the things um, in this particular analysis, it's also based on, it's pixel based in the sense that the classifier goes through and classifies each individual pixel in the image independently. So it's not also, it really isn't taking into account context adjacent pixels. There's subsequent analysis you can do to improve that, but really it's an individual pixel classifier. Um, going forward a little bit, um, people started to develop a geographic object-based image analysis, which works on a slightly different protocol, which starts by segmenting the image into clusters or identifiable objects within the scene. So grouping pixels first into clusters and then classifying those clusters. The authors of the original study in um, the Great Divide Basin repeated their analysis um, using uh, GeoVIA, object-based uh, image analysis, um, and compared uh, their results using the uh, object-based image analysis on two different images two different resolutions of imagery, uh, high resolution quick bird imagery, which has lower spectral resolution. So you're increasing the spatial resolution, but you're only getting four bands, a near infrared and a visible spectrum. Then they also did it um, using newer version of Landsat, which is Landsat 8, uh, which has a, a, a multi-spectral sensor similar to Landsat 7, a little bit more refined, but overall pretty similar. But again, coarser spatial resolution. So you're looking at like 15 meter spatial resolution after it's pan sharpened. Um, and then they compared those two, which were object-based analyses against their initial um, neural network analysis, which was pixel-based on that earlier Landsat 7. And it turns out that they were able to get improved results using that quick bird uh, imagery. Um, and they apparently the increased spatial resolution really benefits the analysis. So a lot of the, the areas or the outcrops uh, in which fossils occur can be, they can range in size between a few square meters to hundreds of, you know, hundreds of square meters, even square kilometers. So there's a big range in size, but some of them are quite small. Um, but the smaller ones can actually be quite productive. So identifying those smaller patches is one of the challenges. And of course, you need the higher spatial resolution for that. Um, but it, it kind of begs the question, in, well, in these analyses, all of these analyses up to this point are relying strictly on the reflectance properties in the individual, individual satellite images. And what we'd you know, ideally like to be able to do is incorporate additional information. Again, topography, slope really affect erosion which influences um, where you're going to find and should really aid um, a classifier in identifying prospective new fossil sites. Um, that hasn't been done in, in a paleontological or paleobiological context yet, but there are analyses uh, in forestry and other remote sensing applications that do leverage machine learning on um, diverse data sets. So they're able to pull in and pair the remote sensing and satellite information with LIDAR data and um, even expert uh, photo interpretation uh, layers as well. So being able to combine those types of analysis um, turns out to be also really productive. And there's some examples of doing that um, using machine learning um, algorithms. And uh, I think especially they're using random forest and Barada. Um, so the question then becomes, uh, given that at MLP, 
we have improved fossil data. So we have one of the best, de deta most detailed data sets on the specific location of individual fossils because we're one of the first projects to basically uh, individually locate fossils as we collect them. Um, so how can we use that individual piece pervenience information to, to gain kind of a detailed understanding of the location of fossils. So in this image, for instance, it, this is showing each red dot is an individual fossil. And on the left, I'm zooming into actually this area right here, where we have one of the densest clusters of fossils, densest concentrations of fossils on the landscape. And you can see the fossils are clearly associated with lighter patches in the imagery. So on the left, right, you have the same image left with the fossils overlaid and right with them removed, just so you can see some of the um, differences in the reflected patterns. And essentially these brighter patches are areas where um, some of the overlying volcanics are removed and you've got good erosion and good exposure of the fossils and the fossil containing beds. Um, so one question is how well can we apply these types of technologies to a specific local fossil site like Mille Logia. And then thinking more broadly, how might we do this across a broader range of fossil sites as they're known in East Africa? And if you begin to look at the pattern and geographic distribution of fossil sites, for instance, this is all the fossil sites we know of older than 2 million years. Um, they're not randomly distributed. <laughs> they're clearly clustered along the East African Rift Valley. Um, partly as a result of geological and tectonic forces. So um, the, the East African Rift is formed by the um, separation of three major tectonic plates, the Somali plate down here, the Arabian plate up here, and the main African plate. And as they pull apart, it's creating major trenches or rifts, um, some of which are filled in to form the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. And then the third leg of that split comes down into Africa and exposes basically that the grub and the depressions, the valleys that are created by this rifting expose a lot of the sediments that um, are of the right age and contain fossils. And the question is, in this area, how can we systematically survey a large region to be able to recover and identify new fossil locations? And how can we pull in and organize systematically and quickly um, the large amounts of satellite imagery that might be applicable to um, a systematic um, continental approach or, or regional approach to the search for new fossils. A second potential and interesting application is as we were discussing before, how, when we find an individual fossil, how do we know to what taxon that fossil might be affiliated? And how can we kind of consistently ascribe taxonomic identifications to fossil specimens? This, like the classification of remote, sense, remote sensing data, is a classification problem just with a different set of data. In this case, you're looking at the uh, volumetric data or the image um, planar data to identify morphological features and try to compare those with known data sets that have already been identified. So it's partly a clustering kind of operation, but also a classification algorithm. Uh, and the question is whether machine learning might be appropriate for this type of technique as well. And more broadly than just morphology, um, is the identification also of surface modifications on bones. Um, this is from a paper we published uh, from one of the most remarkable finds that came out of Dikika, where I also work, which again was the area about 60 kilometers south of Mille Logia, um, where we found a fragment of bone that had um, two small marks on it that were very consistent in their shape, size, and dimensions with the marks that are made by stone tools when hominids butcher bones. The interesting thing about these particular marks is that they are about, they occur on a fossil that is about 800,000 years older than the earliest known archaeology. 
And this really sparked a very um, active debate about how we identify things like cut marks and other surface modifications that are associated with important behaviors of interest in the fossil record. So how do we identify early butchery practices and other things like that? And the challenge with this is that the data are small. We only have essentially one or two fossils that have these marks at this age. We have a lot of comparative data and you're asking me, what is taphonomy? Well, taphonomy is a study of how things get into the fossil record. So what processes do they undergo as they go from being living tissues to fossils? How do they mineralize? What kind of distortions? And what kind of biases come to affect the fossil record relative to a living biological assemblage? And included with that are what kinds of marks tend uh, or can occur on bones and how do we identify them and associate them with specific causes in, in prehistory. And so one thing we would like to be able to do is be able to say, okay, given this mark with this morphology, how does it compare to a training data set of all known cut marks and all known marks created by other types of activities, be it trampling, uh, crocodile or carnivore marks, how can we distinguish these different sets of activities? Um, and again, I think this might be, it's a class, it's a type of classification problem in which we want to describe like a likelihood to this particular mark relative to um, a large training set of known marks, which we actively create in the laboratory. So we'll feed carcasses to hyenas, see what kind of marks they make, feed carcasses to crocodiles, see what kind of marks they make under known conditions and then compare that to the fossil record. So to kind of summarize, um, basically there's a set of challenges um, that I'm thinking of that I think machine learning might be helpful for. And that is how can we use comprehensive spatial data on the location of fossils to better identify new fossil sites within a given small area? How might we do that same thing over a larger continental scale? And how can we use um, machine learning to match 3D scans to ex uh, existing fossil bones to more systematically identify and attribute fossils to, to different categories? Right now, we rely on expert knowledge, but that's subjective. So how can we shift that? Um, and more broadly, are there applications for AI machine learning that would facilitate um, bringing additional data sets online and digitizing them? Right now we're in the process of, of a really arduous ta task of doing kind of manual metadata description on existing data sets. So how might we facilitate that process as well to get those data sets um, into a place where they're directly comparable with other such data sets in the linked data cloud and be able to draw on them as training data. Um, I just wanna make a quick shout out to my friends and colleagues who help with the field work. Um, everything we do in, in, in Mille Logia is, is kind of a team effort within our team um, that involves a really wonderful group of international collaborators. Uh, and yeah, and then uh, if there are any other additional questions, ideas, I'm really here to hopefully try to initiate a conversation and find people who might be interested in helping me tackle some of these challenges. So thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to chat with you. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, we're all virtually clapping for you. <laughs> um, one, we have some questions that people asked uh, in the chat that sort of revolve around how you're actually measuring accuracy and what the baselines are. Um, I was sort of interested in, you know, how large are these data sets that you're talking about? Because a lot of these things that you might want to do really require a, a lot of data. And I, I get I get the feeling that, you know, you have sort of a handful, oh, for some of these problems, you only have sort of a handful of, of known, you know, uh, bones to work with, per se. Uh, can you give us a sense of, of, of scale? Yeah. For the remote sensing aspect of it, I think the, the advantage is we do actually have access to pretty um, large data sets in terms of the available satellite imagery. Um, there's now pretty comprehensive coverage globally and, and ongoing pretty much daily imaging of the entire planet 
through facilities like planet.com, et cetera, which have these microsatellite arrays that are now imaging the entire globe on a daily basis. So there's a, there's a lot of available satellite data. What, what is limited, I guess, your, your, the real limitation is the number of training sites that we can use to in, inform a classifier, which is how many sites do we know of that have fossil data? Um, there's currently about, as I mentioned, uh, oh, 30 or so fossil sites, each of which have mm, numerous or various number of localities. But I'd say in total, there's probably something like 3,000 known localities for hominid fossils, like individual points on the ground where you, within, say, a few meters, you know, a fossil was found. Um, and again, using even those, say, 3,000 individual sites or locations as training data really requires integrating all the existing data. And we're still doing that. But yeah, let's say 3,000 is, is the number of known fossil sites, at least for hominid fossils. Now, if you expand that to all vertebrate fossils, you're starting to get into a, a much larger number, like order of tens of thousands, maybe. Um, when it comes to doing, say, the morphological analysis, we have very few fossils. But we have lots of training data on the other side in terms of comparative samples with regard to extant organisms. But as you get in the fossil record, again, you're down to just a few thousand individuals um, that make up the hominid fossil record. And within any species, uh, the best known species like Australopithecus afarensis has maybe four or 500 specimens. Okay, so that's gonna be challenging. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, can, can you say anything about, uh, some people want some more technical discussion, description of how you're measuring accuracy in terms of finding uh, locations, and uh, someone else asked, are there sufficient locations for which we know that there are no fossils? How, how, that, how many sites do we know that negatives are true negatives? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, in, the, in the study that was done in the Great Divide Basin, um, I think the total sample size where they, the number of sites that they went back and visited, I have to check, but it's probably a few on the order of hundreds. So they had uh, tens of sites or localities, like I think 26, where they knew fossils occurred. And then I think the total study was on something around 200 fossil localities where they compared to see if fossils were present or not. And that's the basis for constructing the confusion matrix and understanding the um, overall prediction accuracy, which is, which is pretty small numbers overall. Um, much more important is figuring out where fossils aren't. And it's only now that we've started really keeping track of places where we've been and have not found fossils. The negative evidence is equally important. Um, we're only just starting to acquire that. unfortunately. And have these, you know, neural network techniques that you mentioned, are they relatively recent or are they from, you know, 10 years ago or, I mean, it's basically, you know, a lot, a lot's happened, in, you know, in the, in the last 10 years, let's say. Right. No, I think most of these are, uh, well, the original analysis, um, from 2011, uh, obviously that uh, that neural network analysis used, um, I think, older algorithms. Um, and but I think random forest is pretty recent. I'm not sure when that was developed. Um, but that analysis on forestry is, yeah, uh, going to be using more up to date algorithms. But again, I am not an expert on the algorithms. Um, that's actually what I'm hoping to gain some insights on. Yeah, well, de well definitely. I mean, if, if they were running, if they were doing neural net stuff in 2011, I mean, there's uh, a lot, you know, the world has changed, you know, dramatically since then. I mean, so it, it could be interesting to to try more advanced technology on those, up on some updated data sets. And today, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Um, obviously, we can find you online, um, but you know, I, I suppose they could also send us an email since they've, I've already been sending them emails about this um, seminar. So 
Uh, can I go ahead and put people in touch with you? Can they find you online? What's the best way? Yeah, either email or Twitter. So I'm at Danae Reed on Twitter or uh, readd at austin.utexas.edu. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that piano music you hear, that's my daughter playing that music <laughs> means that it's time to go. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for giving our talk. Uh, you know, it was very interesting and fascinating to see you know, what kind of problems you're up against and what sort of techniques you're using. Um, you know, these are really amazing problems uh, to work on. So um, I'm, you know, ex excited to see what comes of this. So thanks again. Thanks again for the opportunity. And uh, I really welcome any, you know, feedback and, and ideas that people have. So I really appreciate it.